Good evening and welcome to the Revelation of Jesus Christ. We're glad to have each of you here tonight and we hope that as we continue now with the third series that we've been doing on the book of Revelation and this series tonight we're covering from Revelation the 13th chapter through the 16th chapter. Those are the chapters that we're covering. So those of you that are joining us by television or by radio or on the internet, we're very, very happy to welcome you here and hope that as we continue studying the book of Revelation, you're going to see as God puts things together that are taking place and are going to take place before Jesus comes. So we ask that this will bless you in a special way. Uh, if you are tuning in with us for the first time, or if you haven't seen but a program or two, I probably should take a moment just to say a word to you about what we have here. Because uh, what you see on the screen and behind me is trying to depict where John received his visions. Because if you go to Revelation, the fourth chapter, this is where the Lord told John, come up here, and he brought him into the throne room, and he showed him all the visions that take place in the book of Revelation. In that throne room are 24 elders, there are angels, but there's four living creatures that stand there at the throne of God, and that's what we're depicting here with these creatures that you see. It says one was like a lion, one was like, had the face of a lion, I should say, one had the face of an ox, Another had the face of a man, and another had the face of an eagle. Those four living creatures represent the characteristics of Jesus Christ. They have great, great meaning, and so if you don't know much about them, I hope you'll go back and refresh yourself with the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation as you find out what it has to say about it. Tonight... Our subject is entitled, The Beast from the Sea. And so we're looking at Revelation, the 13th chapter tonight. And I think you'll find that there's a lot in there. There is. There's things in there that we'll have to take a very close look at. And uh, we've entitled this series, uh, this section of Revelation, The Three Angels' Messages, because in Revelation 14, there are three distinct messages that God is giving and that you and I need to understand. So that's what we've entitled it, and we hope that it'll bless you. Uh, in Revelation, the 13th chapter, are two beasts. We're going to look at the first one tonight, the beast from the sea. But there also is another beast there that is a two-horned beast that in our study tomorrow night, we're going to see represents the United States. And so we begin to get a picture of the part that the United States is going to play in bringing all this to a close. And so uh, you want to be sure and tune in and be with us as we take a look at the United States in Bible prophecy. I think you'll find it will help you as you uh, understand the book of Revelation. But tonight we're taking a look at the first beast, the beast. From the sea, rose up out of the sea. What the scripture has to say about this beast is most important. We're very happy tonight to have with us his voice, male quartet. And uh, I'm going to introduce them to you. I think you'll find that uh, you're going to enjoy them in a special way. So we're very happy to have with us. We'll uh, start here with. Uh, Doug Leno. Doug is the bass of the quartet, and I'm sure that you, you'll hear his deep ba bass voice as we go through. And then we have, uh, uh, excuse me, we have Todd, Todd Spainhauer. Todd is the first tenor in the quartet. And then we have uh, right beside him, uh, I'll get all the names right here. It just takes me a moment. Kevin Spainauer, and uh, he is the second tenor. And then on the end there, we have 
uh, Harold Dixon, and Harold is the baritone. And uh, these three right here are all nephews of Donna, so don't, don't hold that against them if you <laughs> won't, and, uh, and all. And I'm sure that you're going to be blessed in a special way as they sing for you tonight. They're going to sing a great song in, entitled Good News, The Chariots Are Coming. But before they sing, uh, Chuck Algar is going to come out and read to you our scripture for tonight out of the book of Revelation. So you want to open your Bibles and follow it. When Chuck's through reading, the quartet will sing for us. Good evening. You have your Bibles with you? Please turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10 together. So if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles and we'll read together. Let us read. Then I stood, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. His deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? who was able to make war with him. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. May God add his blessing to his word. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want to leave me behind. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want to leave me behind. There's a long white robe in the heaven I know. There's a long white robe in the heaven I know. There's a long white robe in the heaven I know, and I don't want to leave me behind. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want to leave me behind. There's a golden crown in the heaven I know. There's a golden crown in the heaven I know. There's a golden crown in the heaven I know, and I don't want to leave me behind. Good news. Good news, chariots are coming. Good news. Good news, chariots are coming. Good news. Good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want to leave me behind. There's a starry crown in the heaven I know. There's a starry crown in the heaven I know. There's a starry crown in the heaven I know, and I don't want to leave me behind. Good news. Good news, chariots are coming. Good news. Good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want to leave me behind. Well, there's a golden harp in the heaven, I know. There's a golden harp in the heaven, I know. There's a golden harp in the heaven, I know, and I don't want to leave me behind. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming. Good news, good news, chariots are coming, and I don't want to leave me behind.
Father. We're thankful for the good news. And we certainly don't want to be left behind. So we ask tonight as we open your word that you'll give to us insight, enlighten our minds, the prophecies that you have given. May we see them clearly. And as we do, Lord, may our faith be increased. May we be willing to walk in the light of your word and that each of us may look forward anxiously to the day in which you're returning. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. This beast of Revelation, the 13th chapter, is mentioned more in Scripture than any other beast. Now, Scripture uses beast to represent nations or powers. This is what God uses, and He talks about them. And as you study Bible prophecy, it refers to beast as he. It refers to the church as she. And you'll find that's all true true all the way through. And this beast is extremely important because God says more about this particular beast than any other in Scripture. Therefore, it's very important that you tonight become crystal clear in your mind as to who this beast is because he plays a tremendous part in the events that take place in the last days. So you've got to be clear. You've got to understand it. You can't be led astray from what God's Word says. And so tonight... As we take a look at this beast from the sea, it's important that we find out what the Scripture has to tell us about it. So let's take a look, see what it has to say here. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, on his heads a blasphemous name. So this beast is coming up out of the sea. Different, different than any beast that's been before it. It's a nondescript beast. It has seven heads, has ten horns on it. It is symbolic of a power, a power that is to be used in a special way in the last days, and therefore it's described as a nondescript beast. goes on and says... Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, great authority. So this beast is made up of parts of other beasts. Because he has the body of a leopard. Feet of a lion, of a bear, mouth of a lion, and particularly it's important that you notice that the dragon gave to him his power, his seat, and his authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. His deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled, followed the beast. Those, this particular beast that has risen out of the sea who has received power from the dragon, it says that he receives a deadly wound. But that deadly wound evidently doesn't continue because it says the deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. Who gave authority to the beast? The dragon. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast 
saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So this particular power is not just a political power. Now, beasts in Scripture represent political powers. It's what they represent. But this beast is different. It's different because it receives what? It receives worship. Therefore, it is not just a political power. It is also a religious power. So you have a religious political power here that is going to play a very, very definite part in the events that happen in the last days. So this beast is made up of four others. It says that this beast has the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his authority. Well, those of you who have followed me on other uh, subjects, we find out that these four beasts are mentioned in Daniel the seventh chapter. And in the seventh chapter of Daniel, you have a lion, you have a bear, you have a leopard, and you have a dragon. That's what's pictured here. Those four beasts. And this particular beast is made up of parts of those four. And so it's defining exactly who this beast is. But let us continue on. And he was given a mouth speaking great things, blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue 42 months, a time set on this beast. Then he opened his mouth in blaspheme against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwelt in heaven. So this particular beast is contrary to God. He blasphemes God, blasphemes his name, his tabernacle. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So not only does he blaspheme God, but he is against those who are followers of God. Because it says here that he made war with the saints. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it says, all those whose names are what? All those whose names are not written in the book of life will worship him. So what you're getting, and you should see here, is there are two sides. There are those who follow the Lamb and those who follow the beast. That's clearly what it's saying here. Two sides. Those who follow the Lamb will walk with Him and they are those who worship Him. But these who follow the beast will follow His leadings and will worship Him. Okay? If anyone has an ear, let him hear. And any time the Scripture uses that phrase, you put it down that this is something that God wants you to know. He would not say, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He's telling you, this is important. This you need to know. You need to understand this. So these are vital things you need to know. Now, in those points I have just given you, God gives seven points of identification of this beast, so you don't have to be in doubt. God is identifying this beast clearly, because he gives us these seven points. It says, one, he would make war with the saints. It's one point. Two, that he would speak blasphemies. Three, power and authority from the dragon. Four, rule for 1,260 years. He would receive a deadly wound. The deadly wound would be healed. All the world would wander after the beast. Those seven points God gives you so you don't have to be in doubt. And let me pause here and say this to you. You must understand tonight we're talking about a power. We're talking about a system. We are not talking about people. 
Do not take what is said here tonight and apply it to individuals. This is about a system, a system of false worship, a system that goes contrary to God. We're not talking about people. We're talking about a system. That you need to be clear in your mind as we go through. Take a look at it. Okay. If you, if you can take these seven points that just have listed here and apply them to any other power on the face of the earth, I'd like to know it. I have studied this particular subject for 40 years. I have never found it fits any other power but this one. Now, don't, don't make four of them fit it. All seven must fit. If all those seven fit, then you can be absolutely sure that this is who it is talking about. So we're going to go through tonight and take a look at these seven points and how they fit this particular power in particular. Revelation 13, verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now those beasts that we just read about, the lion, the bear, the leopard, they represented nations. They represented Babylon, which was the lion. They represented Medo-Persia, which was the bear. And they represented Greece, which was the leopard. You can go back to Daniel 7. It makes that absolutely clear. The dragon mentioned here represented pagan Rome. Now, what it's saying here is the dragon gave him this particular beast, his power, and his throne, his great authority. The dragon that you find here is also mentioned in Revelation, the 12th chapter. This was pagan Rome, and it says that pagan Rome was going to give to this power its power, its authority, its throne. That was going to be handed to them. History tells us that this is exactly what happened, exactly what took place. This is from the professor of history, University of Rome, Labaca, Leblanca. To the succession of the Caesars, pagan Rome, came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. This was the beginning of what history has recorded is that of papal Rome. Pagan Rome gave to papal Rome its power, its seat, and its authority. Very, very important. The dragon, which was papal Rome. Now, when you talk about the dragon, we need to clarify something. Because Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 9, tells you that the dragon here also represents the devil. It says the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. So, this dragon also represents the devil, but the devil does not come out and do things openly. He always uses a power or a system. And the system the devil used here to accomplish this was pagan Rome. So pagan Rome gave to papal Rome its power, its seat, and its authority. History goes on and says this. In 537, Silverus was banished by Belsarius, and the deacon Vigilus was then elected pope. Okay. Uh, let me read a little bit more, and then I want to tell you a little bit. From this time on, bishops more and more involved in worldly events no longer belong solely to the church. They are men of the state and then rulers of the state. What happened is the emperor of Rome at this time was an emperor by the name of Justinian. At this time in history, you have one of the phenomena that have taken place in history when you have great masses of people all move at one time. 
And if you go back in history and read it, these were called the Goths. They were barbarians. And they were moving down on the Roman Empire and taking it piece by piece. They were such tribes as the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Hurliai, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths. They were taking over the Roman Empire. Justinian was fighting them. He was trying to drive them back to keep them out of the Roman Empire. In the city of Rome, Sylvestus, the bishop of Rome, was a godly man. He refused to take part in the war. If, if the Goths got close to the city of Rome, he closed the gates and wouldn't let them in. If, uh, if Justinian's army got close to the city of Rome, he closed the gates and wouldn't let them in. He, he just kept them out. And, of course, Justinian was not happy about this. The Goths have backed Justinian's army clear up to the walls of the city of Rome. And it looks like they're going to wipe them out. And Belsarius, who was Justinian's general, sent a note to Justinian and said, Do something or we're going to be lost. Well, it so happened that the emperor, Justinian's wife, was a Christian. She was not only a Christian, she was a friend of the bishop. And so he pled with her and got her to go and talk to the bishop, Silverus, and to plead with him to open the gates of the city of Rome, which she did. And out of respect to her, he opened the gates of the city of Rome and let Justinian's army in, closed the gates, and kept the Goths out. But Justinian and Belsarius had already agreed if they got inside the city, they would banish the bishop. So when they got inside the city, they banished the bishop. And Justinian put his own person in the seat of the bishop, who was Vigilus. Justinian never had any idea but what? For Gillis would simply be a puppet in his hands to use as he wanted. But history says that the Bishop of Rome stepped to the seat of Caesar and seized the scepter. So we find that Vigilus ascended the papal chair 538 A.D. under the military protection of of Belsarius. Alright, so you need to remember particularly this date of 538 A.D. It becomes very important as we take a look at this beast that's rising up out of the sea. It's saying basically he is going to rise 538 A.D. Alright, let's go on. And he opened his mouth in blaspheme against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. So it says that this beast is going to blaspheme God. What we need to do here is we need to define from Scripture what blasphemy is. What is blasphemy when Scripture says that he would blaspheme? The Bible identifies blaspheming as claiming to be God or claiming power to forgive sins. That's blasphemy. When I as an individual claim to be God. Or if I say. That I have the power to forgive sin. Watch. And the Jews answered him. Answered Jesus saying. For a good work. We do not stone you. But for blasphemy, and because you being a man make yourself God. They said, we're not stoning you for this. We're stoning you because you blasphemed God. You said you were God. Of course, Christ had every right to say that he was God. 
But, uh, but they blasphemed him because, or were going to stone him because he said he was God. What did they say? Pope says, great encyclical Leo, uh, the great encyclical letter of Pope Leo XIII says, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. That's their own statement. I can read you numbers of others. One place it says, all the names which apply to Christ apply to the Pope. So they definitely make that statement that they are God. What about forgiveness of sin? And the scribes and the Pharisees begin to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Listen, they're saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Christ had forgiven this woman her sin. And they said, what's, what's he doing? He doesn't have the power to forgive sin. Only God can do this. Does the priest truly forgive sins? Or does he only declare that they are remitted? Does the priest really say that he has the power to forgive sins? The priest does really and truly forgive sin in the virtue of the power given him by Christ. And he says he has the power to forgive sins. Now, folks, what I'm doing is I'm taking you through those points of identification one by one so that you understand clearly who this power is. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So it says that he was going to make war with the saints to overcome them. And if you go back in history, this is not hard to find. In fact, history has this to say about it. The Church of Rome, I'm reading from the history of the rise and the influence of the spirit of rationalism in Europe by Licky. The Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that's ever existed among mankind. Shed more innocent blood than any other institution that's ever existed. And all you have to do is go back and read about the period known in history as the Dark Ages. Uh, if you want to read some books, well then read such books as Fox Book of Martyrs. Or short, short stories, the Reformation. Or the history of Europe by, Qual by Qualbin. Or Here I Stand by Bainton. And they will list for you case after case, such as the massacre of St. Bartholomew, where they slew 60,000 Huguenots one Sunday morning. History is full of what has taken place when it says she would make war with the saints. Indeed, she's done just that. Will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. History bears that fact out without any question. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Now, we're looking at these points one by one, and, and God ties it down so that you don't have to have any question about it. It says this particular beast is going to have authority for 42 months. So in Bible prophecy, what does that mean? Well, we found out that the papal power came to rule or came into power in 538 A.D., Okay, let's see what happens from this. Says that he was going to be in authority for 42 months. In Bible reckoning of time, there are 30 days in a biblical month. If you need to look that up, you'll find that in Genesis, the 8th chapter, clearly defined that there are 30 days in a biblical month. Okay, so if we multiply 
30 times 42, it gives us 1,260 days. And in Bible prophecy, we find that a day represents one year. Ezekiel, the fourth chapter, verse 6, tells us that. So if I've got 42 months, that's 1,260 days, and each day represents a year, giving me a total of 1,260 years. That she was going to be in authority, and history bears this out completely, that that's exactly what happened, because when you add 1,260 to 538 A.D., it takes you to the date of 1798. Going to rule or be in authority for 1260 years. It's exactly what took place because the scripture continues and it tells us this. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. So I looked at his heads and I saw his head as it had been mortally wounded. 538 to 1798, it was that time given them to be in authority. But come 1798, something was, must take place. Something had to happen. This time in history, Napoleon has come to rule. Napoleon wants to rule Europe. He said Europe was soon to become one nation, and he wanted to rule Europe. And so he knew, Napoleon knew full well that he could never accomplish this as long as papal Rome had power. And so this is what took place in 1798. This is the Encyclopedia Americana. In 1798, he, Berthier, that's Napoleon's general, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. Just as Scripture had said, 1260 years, when that 1260 years came to an end, the papal power came to an end. Berthier marched into Rome, took the Pope prisoner, in fact, was taken back to France where he died in prison. This was done 1798 as the Scripture said that it would. So it received a deadly wound. Now, folks, when that happened, uh, you need to understand that the papal power was extremely strong. Uh, they owned what was called papal states. Those papal states were as big as some of the states in the United States. So they had huge, huge amounts of land. Their power extended all the way across the country. It even extended into Britain. Great, great power. When Napoleon came in and took them prisoner, he took away all that, abolished that government, set up a secular power. Okay? And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. His deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled and followed the beast. So it says this deadly wound that he received was healed. Now, if all this was taken away from him, in order for it to be healed, what had to happen? Had to be given back. That's simply what it's saying. Had to be given back. When that was taken away in 1798, this began in history what was called the Roman question. And uh, this went on for over 100 years. There were many, many efforts made to reestablish the papal government. But every time they tried, uh, it was always depending on the Italian parliament. And they would not accept that. That went back and forth, back and forth for over 100 years. Until finally we come to the 1900s. 
In the 1900s, there's a man who has come to power in Italy who is no longer controlled by the Italian parliament. His name is Mussolini. Mussolini decides that he's going to settle the Roman question. And so negotiations were set up with the papal power. That went back and forth for quite some time until finally they worked out what was called the Lateran Pact. And this Lateran Pact was signed and put into place. This is a picture of the signing of the Lateran Pact. Interesting, because certain things were given back to them, which I'll go over with you in just a moment. Those things that were given back to them reestablished them. But I, the Pope here, who is seated there, the Pope made a statement at the end that I found most interesting because he ended that speech that he gave by saying these words, Go and have babies. That was the, how he ended that speech. Go and have babies. Now watch. It gave back to the papal power the signing. This is the signing of the Lateran Pact, 1929. Okay? The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past. The Vatican was at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing of the what? Wound. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. This is what it gave back to them. It made Vatican City a sovereign what? government. Now, you need to understand that when Napoleon came in and took it all away, all that was left was that they were a church. That's what they were. They were a church, like the same as all churches. But with the signing of the Lateran Pact, it made them more than a church. It made them a sovereign government. It gave them the rights of other governments. It paid them, this is 1929, February 11, 1929, it paid them $21 million for the spoliation of the papal states. Now, now folks, in 1929, $21 million was a lot of money. It paid them that. It gave them the right to send and receive ambassadors from every country in the world. It gave them diplomatic immunity. And it united church and state. That's what the signing of the Lateran Pact did for them. The deadly wound, which they had had there for over a hundred years, was healed. What took place made a definite difference in it. Today, you can see the effects of that. If, if you wanted to go to one place in the world where in a close confinement you could find more ambassadors from all the country of the world, where would you go? You'd go to the Vatican. Because there in just a short or little confinement, you have all the ambassadors of the world. They have the right to send ambassadors and receive them. The United States has an ambassador today. For years we didn't. Today we do. It gave them all the rights of a nation. In fact, I've had people call me up on the phone and say, Brother Cox, when the Pope came over here and uh, visited the United States, uh, as you remember, they go through a lot of rigmarole when he comes and all. And these folks called me up and said, Brother Cox, they don't have the right to do this. They're spending our tax dollars on, on this. They, they don't have the right to do that. 
And I'm sorry, but I have to tell them, yes, they do. They have every right to do it because our, constant, our Constitution guarantees the head of state protection. And he is the head of a state. Therefore, we have to give him protection just the same as we do anything else. Have you ever noticed that he spoke at the United Nations? Well, let me ask you a question tonight. What other religious leader has spoken at the United Nations? Huh? Oh, yes. Who? The Dalai Lama. Because he is the head of a state. And head of the state, they have the right to speak at the United Nations. So this is giving them back all their authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mournly wounded. His deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled and followed the beast. So this beast received a deadly wound. It's healed. Now it says that all the world followed the beast. Well, let's see what's happening. What has happened since that day? Since 1929, what has happened? It says all the world is going to follow him. All right. In 1929... We don't know. I've tried to find it. I've not been able to come up with it. What the membership of the Catholic Church was. But it wasn't too big, I'll assure you. Today, the membership of the Catholic Church stands at 1.4 billion. Now you have a little bit of an idea why he told them, go have babies. Membership has risen unbelievably. Ambassadors, 1929, they didn't have any. Today, 180. Civil power, 1929, taken away from them. Today, sovereign. 1929, they didn't have any leadership. All gone. Today, it's one of the foremost in the world. Though all the world wandered after the beast. Both John the Revelator and Paul believe this power to be the Antichrist. As you read through the scripture, you'll find that John speaks of him that way. So does Paul. John in 1st and 2nd John speaks of him clearly as the Antichrist. Listen to Paul's words. 2nd Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or is worshipped. Now, I was talking about this man of sin who reveals himself that here exalts himself, what? Above God, or is called God or worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, folks, what you have to understand is that word antichrist. That word antichrist, to you and I, when we see the word anti, we, we immediately think of against, that it's against something. But that's not the way it's used here in Scripture. It actually, that word antichrist means in place of, instead of. That's what Paul is saying here, uh, showing himself that he is God, sitting in the temple of God. The, this is a power that is usurping, if you please, the position of God, setting himself in the place of God. Now, John and Paul both looked upon this power as the Antichrist. If, if, this, if this power is, how should I put it, putting himself in the place of God, 
Does the scripture give us any idea of this? I want you to follow this with me. A description of the Antichrist. Now, Antichrist means in place of. I have listed over here on one side things about Christ. I've listed on the other side things about the beast or the Antichrist. Watch these. We find that Jesus began his ministry coming out of the water. He was baptized in Luke and saying coming out of the water. And it says in Luke the third chapter he began his ministry. We find that this beast in Revelation 13 comes out of what? Comes out of the water. It says that Christ was one with his father. We find that this beast is one with the dragon. We find that Christ said clearly that his authority came from his father. We find here that this beast says his authority comes from the dragon. Okay? Find that Christ in Revelation, the 19th chapter, when he comes back on this white horse, he's wearing a crown. The beast wears crowns. We find that when this beast, it talks about him wheeling a sword in Revelation 1, 16. I mean, Christ wheeling a sword. It talks about the beast wheeling a sword, Revelation. We find that in Revelation, the uh, fifth chapter, verse 6, we find that this beast had uh, seven, Christ had horns, seven horns. The beast has ten horns, okay? We find that Christ's ministry lasted how long? Three and a half years. This beast was given 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. Both given the same period of time. He received a deadly wound. Christ did. So does the beast receive a deadly wound. Christ came back from the dead. The deadly wound was healed. You can see the comparison in Scripture, when it talks about Christ and the Antichrist in place of. That's what the Scripture's telling us. So it's very, very important tonight that you know who this beast is because it says here in Revelation 13, verse 10, here is the patience of the saints. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Very important that you and I are, how should I put it, settled in what we understand and what we believe. If you have this beast clear in your thinking, then as we continue on through the book of Revelation, it's going to come up over and over and over again. And if you're clear, then all that will begin to fall together for you and you'll understand it. So let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you're willing to help us to know what the future holds, to understand where we're going. Bless each one that's here tonight, those that are watching by television or listening on the radio or watching through the Internet. Bless them, Lord. May they understand your word clearly. May our hearts be given to you, and may we desire to follow your word, to keep our hearts open, and to walk with you in all that we do. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, tomorrow evening, our subject is entitled, The United States. What does the Bible say about the United States? And so we hope each of you will be here. Good night. God bless you. All around us, we see want and suffering. In large cities, millions of human beings do not receive as much care and consideration as we give beasts to the field. Families are herded together in miserable projects. Children are born into these terrible places. They see nothing of the beauty God has created to delight their senses. They're left to grow up molded and fattened by wretched and wicked examples all around them. They hear the name of God only in profanity. 
impure words and fumes of liquor and tobacco and immoral behavior of every kind pervert their tender senses. Wretched and pitiful cries for food and clothing are heard by parents who know nothing about prayer or loving Savior. But these cries do not go unheard in heaven. God sees, God hears. Friends, our loving Father has entrusted us with abundance to supply the necessities of all. But sadly, we're not always faithful stewards. Many who have taken on the name of Christ spend his money for selfish pleasure, extravagant homes and clothing. They hardly give a suffering human a look of pity or a word of sympathy. We are to show the kindness of the Samaritan in food, clothing, and shelter for the poor. As Christians, our work is to reach the people who are neglected and win them to Christ. That's the goal of this ministry. We want them to know that He is able to save to the uttermost and restore them to His image. But in order to do this, we need your help. Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the series The Three Angels' Messages may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series including Beast from the Sea, United States, First Angel's Message, Second Angel's Message, Third Angel's Message, Second Coming of Christ, and The Seven Last Plagues may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.